Hello. Thank you for joining us for this AGA webinar on building a non-procedural women's GI health service line. I'm Dr. Larry Kaczynski. I'm the chair of the AGA Institute Practice Management and Economics Committee, and I'm in private practice in the Chicagoland area and am one of the managing partners of the Illinois Gastroenterology Group. This webinar is the final one, at least for this time, in our series of three, which we, we hope will help you as you consider ways to expand your practice services and hopefully boost your revenue. The AGA Practice Management and Economics Committee has been focused on non-procedural business lines ever since 2011. We have identified several potential business lines that represent high-frequency, high-risk services, and identified three experts in the field to provide their insight and advice. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Kimberly Persley, who will be, who provide us a summary of the woman's GI health service that has been developed at Texas Digestive Disease Consultants in Dallas. She will tell us about the challenges that, that exist in building a woman's GI health program in a private practice setting. Once she is done, uh, it will be question time. So please note that all your questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, type your question into the question pane. Now, we will start with my slides, and if I can have uh, my next slide, we can get started. Okay. As we said, uh, we've been doing, we've been looking into this t since t 2011. I took over the Practice Management and Economics Committee in September of 2011, and we immediately began working on this because too many of us are relying on colonoscopy revenue as the majority of the income to our practices. It's currently responsible for about 60% of our revenue. But unfortunately, it's seen its peak, and it's now a mature service. Margins are under pressure already, and we are vulnerable to new technologies that would be either less invasive or less expensive. Next slide. So if we all took a look at our services, most gastroenterologists and gastroenterology uh, practice managers would see something that would look similar to this slide, where most of our revenue is coming from colorectal cancer screening and surveillance and the colonoscopies that are generated from this, and then smaller uh, portions for hepatitis C, GERD, IBD, and IBS should be in there as well. Next slide. This slide shows, in my practice, in IgG, our top 10 ICD-9s by reimbursement. And if you look at this group of um, ICD-9s and summarize them by category, you see that over 50%, 54% of them are related to colorectal cancer screening and surveillance. Although this has been great and has generated a lot of revenue for us over the years, it does make us vulnerable. Now, the second most common one was inflammatory bowel disease, um, and so that's been a subject of, of previous work for us. Next slide. If we look at what the payers are seeing, the payers see a different distribution. Inflammatory bowel disease is much bigger, and colorectal cancer is much less, because what we're not seeing in our practices are the costs to the entire system related to inflammatory bowel disease. Next slide. Crohn's disease expenses, as I said, emanate a lot from inpatient work, and that's where the extra cost is being appreciated that we're not seeing in our practices. Next slide. If we look at Crohn's disease, over a quarter of a billion dollars for our, our local payer was spent for Crohn's disease, and 40% of all the expenses were for hospital services. Actually, it's, all, it's actually close to 50%. Gastroenterologists only received 3.5% of the total spent. So there is an opportunity here uh, to uh, bring us into the process of cost control and possibly share in some of the savings. Next slide. Okay, so this is what spurred the creation of these business lines. We've already had a nutritional 
presentation from Jay Cummerley. We had, we've had one by Karen Hall on geriatric GI, and today we're fortunate to have Kimberly Persley, one of my favorite people, uh, present to us on uh, a, a, a women's GI service line. Next slide. So what does this all mean? GI reimbursement for our procedures is under threat. We need to focus on what the changing market will need. Uh, we need to expand and diversify our services to bring in additional revenue from other places. Change should be an opportunity for us. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kim, and you have the floor. Uh, first, let me just uh, say thank you, uh, Larry, for inviting me to participate into the AGA. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this uh, in this series of uh, webinars on non-procedural uh, service lines and GI. Um, today, what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes focusing on building a women's digestive health center as a possible uh, service line. Next slide. So why even focus on digestive health in women? Um, we know that digestive disorders are common in both men and women. However, gastroenterology health in women can be unique, and digestive health in women can be affected by uh, hormonal fluctuations, pregnancy, and childbirth. Next slide. But if we look at a whole other list of gastrointestinal uh, disorders um, without even considering the effects of hormones, childbirth, and pregnancy, there are a number of disease states that we need to address in our female patients. And it starts with getting our patients in for appropriate colon cancer screening, um, our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, getting them on biologics in a timely fashion, um, after displaying an interest in women's digestive health issues, I began to see more and more patients with pelvic floor dysfunction, and getting these patients um, appropriately treated um, is also an opportunity for us. The rising epidemic of obesity, um, I think as gastroenterologists, uh, we really should be taking the forefront in helping our patients um, with obesity. Next slide. I'd like to uh, present a few cases. This is a patient that I saw recently, 75-year-old woman who presented with, uh, for discussion regarding colon cancer screening. But when you talk to her, you realize that she actually had symptoms for about a year, constipation, thin stools, and intermittent bright red blood rectum. Of interest, uh, she is married, and her husband was diagnosed with rectal cancer about six years ago. I performed a colonoscopy on this patient, and she had a large rectal adenocarcinoma. Um, so why didn't she undergo colon cancer screening at the age of 50? New slide. Next slide. So it's estimated that maybe 50% of patient, uh, female patients over the age of uh, 50 undergo colon, colon cancer screening. And the reason that more women do not undergo colon cancer screening um, are, are various. Uh, less and less, I think, it's... Um, uh, PCP referrals. I think the PCPs know that patients should be referred for colon cancer screening. Cost remains an issue. Um, fear, uh, fear of the procedure, discomfort related to the procedure, fear of finding something, fear of finding nothing. Um, fear seems to be an overriding uh, concern. And then many of our female patients would prefer to undergo this intimate procedure with a female uh, endoscopist. New slide. We know that colonoscopy in women can be technically more difficult. Colons can be slightly longer. Uh, many of our female patients have had prior abdominal surgery, C-sections, uh, hysterectomies, creating adhesions, and you know sometimes it can be difficult man uh, maneuvering the colonoscope through a, um, a sigmoid colon. Um, I remember as a fellow, one of my professors would often say, as we're struggling to get through that sigmoid colon, why can't a woman be more like a ma man? And you may recognize that from um, my fair lady, 
but that's the case. We'd be struggling trying to get through this sigmoid colon, and it was only later in my training that um, you know we be, we began to use more PDF thalamoscopes on these patients to improve their uh, comfort level. Any slides? So what do women want? Well, with colonoscopy, they want less pain and discomfort. Again, using pediatric scopes may um, help to that end. Using uh, more propofol if someone's had a difficult uh, colonoscopy in the past. Um, bowel preps are getting easier. Hopefully, insurance coverage is getting better with uh, uh, changes in health care. Um, but a female endoscopist is something that many of uh, my patients come to me solely because I am a woman and they wanted a, a woman to do their procedure. Uh, next slide. There was an interesting article published a few years ago, um, and in this uh, particular article they did a, a survey of patients and found that up to 48 percent of uh, women preferred a female physician and they were willing to wait longer for a visit or a procedure by a female endoscopist. And that gender preference uh, tended to be um, higher among women compared to men. The gender preference was also seen in patients who had a lower income level and a history of physical or emotional abuse. Next slide. Um, Switching gears a little bit, irritable bowel syndrome, this is also a very common um, disorder that we're seeing in our female patients. Next slide. Irritable bowel can be seen in about 20% of the U.S. population. Most of these patients are women, and it accounts for up to 35% of visits to GI practice. Um, the treatment, successful treatment of irritable bowel in, in several of our, our, of our patients will not only require symptomatic therapy, but also addressing psychosocial uh, problems and dietary concerns. So if we can incorporate those two pieces, addressing uh, mental health and, and psychosocial concerns and dietary um, concerns for our patients, um, that will uh, improve um, the patient experience um, when, when we're treating them for their irritable bowel syndrome. Next slide. The next patient is someone that I saw in the office for pre-pregnancy counseling, a patient with inflammatory bowel disease. She had a history of UC, and in 2009, um, the diagnosis was changed to Crohn's disease after she developed a fistula to um, a previously placed J pouch. Um, she had active inflammation about a year ago. She's had two pregnancies and wanted to have a, another pregnancy and was being seen by a different gastroenterologist uh, who had encouraged her not to um, get pregnant due to concerns about medication and the risk to her pouch. So she came in for questions regarding uh, pregnancy. Next slide. Our patients, our female patients with inflammatory bowel disease, um, there are some unique issues that we should be addressing with them. Um, for the most part, these patients are very compliant taking their medications, and they understand the importance of taking their medications, but I end up counseling them regarding avoiding NSAIDs, excessive amount of NSAIDs if they have uh, severe PMS type syndrome, and they're on a lot of NSAIDs to treat those symptoms. Um, intimacy issues come up frequently, and these are not even issues that I bring up routinely, but um, someone who has perianal disease, um, stoma, uh, very common for them to want to address uh, certain issues regarding intimacy, and fertility is also another topic that comes up frequently that we need to address with our inflammatory bowel disease patients. Next slide. Pre-pregnancy counseling and inflammatory bowel disease, medication safety during conception throughout the pregnancy and uh, during breastfeeding, the role of surgery and uh, um, fertility comes up often, uh, having a discussion regarding the risk of inflammatory bowel disease and offspring of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and I'll have patients come in asking me my uh, recommendations regarding mode of delivery. Will they need to have a C-section? Will they be able to have a normal uh, vaginal delivery. 
uh, postpartum discussion around vaccination of their babies. And although the patients have had discussions with their GYN and their OB, they really want to hear it from you, what your thoughts are as far as is it safe to receive certain vaccinations um, if, if a mom has been on certain medications throughout their pregnancy. Next slide. Um, the third patient is someone that I saw who came into the office with uh, diarrhea for a couple of years. She had small frequent bowel movements that were non-bloody. She's a G4P4, all vaginal deliveries, and she underwent an evaluation for her diarrhea and had a colonoscopy that showed just sigmoid diverticulosis and a tubular adenoma. However, the most striking thing is on exam, she had diminished rectal tone, and when you pushed her further, she did admit to urinary incontinence. And um, what she was actually experiencing was fecal incontinence. And for whatever reason, she was uncomfortable using fecal incontinence as her chief complaint. It was more acceptable to her to use the term, you know, diarrhea and rectal urgency. Next slide. Next slide. So we know that pelvic floor dysfunction is common as our uh, female patients um, uh, become older. Approximately 30% of women will have damage to the anal sphincter during, during a vaginal delivery. And again, patients may have a vague history, and their chief complaint may be a chief complaint of diarrhea or rectal urgency. So if we, if we have this knowledge and recognition about their previous obstetrical history, uh, you know, pushing and asking more questions to focus on the possible um, fecal incontinence is really where we need to uh, be heading with these patients. Next slide. Um, again, it's important with fecal incontinence to ask, get a detailed OB history. Most of us have electronic health records, and there's a section in the health record that has their um, obstetrical history, and that needs to be asked and filled out by who's ever um, inputting that data. Also important to ask about the, in, the impact on the quality of life. Um, my patient with fecal incontinence, she was a very active woman, and now she stopped going out, meeting friends for, for lunch and playing cards because she was so embarrassed by this condition. So asking about how the disease states affect the quality of life of our female patients is also extremely important. Next slide. Workup for pelvic floor uh, problems includes uh, anal rectal manometry, endoscopic ultrasound, and therapy can include uh, sending these uh, patients for biofeedback, uh, sacral nerve stimulation, or performing um, injections um, in the anal canal to treat um, fecal incontinence that has not responded to um, other therapies. Next slide. Other gender-specific issues that I um, end up addressing often uh, include bone health and obesity. I'm in Texas, and the ob obesity epidemic here is huge, um, and it affects women more often than men, women of color. Uh, and it's associated with a number of digestive disorders. Now, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, and gastroesophageal reflux. It surprises me how often I am the first person to actually address this and bring this up um, with our patients um, and to try to get them headed in the right direction to try to treat um, their obesity. And I really think that's um, an area that we can really step into. Next slide. There was an editorial a few years ago in the New, uh, excuse me, in the New York Times, and the title was, uh, Do Women Make Better Doctors? And um, in this particular editorial, uh, th there were surveys sent out to patients, and there were some interesting results from the surveys. In the survey, um, it revealed that patients tended to be more assertive with female physicians. Patients tended to ask more questions with female physicians. And uh, patients reported that female physicians were um, more, were able to spend more time with them um, than some of the male counterparts. Next slide. 
the gender differences uh, in female physicians uh, included that they they tended to be more encouraging and reassuring. Um, they used a shared decision-making model. Uh, they asked more psychosocial questions and, again, were able to spend more time uh, with the patients. And, and this tended to be very attractive uh, to many people. Next slide. When we look at the female patients, the female patients were most satisfied with women doctors if these uh, female physicians were able to express a great deal of concern and empathy and were um, extremely reassuring. Next slide. So why develop a service line that focuses on digestive health issues in women? Well, I think we need to first um, make sure that, number one, there is an interest in the practice um, in the community for such a um, focus. I think when we focus on digestive health issues in women, um, it improves our awareness of certain unique issues that are seen in our female patients that may not be seen in our male patients. It improves our knowledge of certain um, diseases and conditions that can be unique to our female patients. And for me, it really helped me um, with my sensitivity. So, you know, I, if I have a problem, I will see whoever is the most qualified person to treat that problem. Male or female, it doesn't matter. But for many women, it is a big issue. It's a big concern. And, and having, um, being sensitive to that really has uh, resulted in uh, my practice growing um, quite a bit. Next slide. So the questions that I think you have to ask yourself when even considering uh, developing a business line um, for women digestive health is first ask yourself and ask the group, is there an interest to do so? And is there a need? Um, how will it be structured? Uh, what are the patient benefits? What are the practice benefits? How do we market this? What's the financial reimbursement? And what key services or providers will be needed in order to have this um, service line? Next slide. So in an ideal world, I, I would think that all of these little pieces should be in place. So you have to have um, um, a provider who is interested in digestive issues in women. And I work very closely with several internal medicine doctors and um, GYNs here on campus. Ideally, uh, I think there are so many issues with nutrition and how it relates to digestive issues in women. Having a nutritionist that you work with is very important. Um, addressing the mental health of patients, too, um, I, I think is also an area uh, that needs to um, uh, be a part of this whole um, center idea. Uh, exercise, I prescribe exercise to many of my patients. Um, and I think exercise is uh, extremely important in um, improving the quality of life. Next slide. So why do we need to have this uh, health focus? So um, one of the cases I presented earlier, the woman who developed the colon cancer, you know, no one should die of colon cancer because they're too embarrassed to go see someone to have a colonoscopy. Uh, I live in an area where there are a number of uh, very conservative, conservative and orthodox women who would prefer not to have a man involved in performing a procedure of, uh, such as a colonoscopy. And, you know, we're able to accommodate um, that. Most of our nurses and techs at our surgical center are women, so I typically have one day where I have an all-female team, so we can really kind of accommodate those wishes of, of our female patients who would prefer just to have uh, women in the room. And again, I think it just improves our overall understanding um, and empathy um, for, for our female patients. Next slide. So after I made the decision to um, really have a focus on digestive wellness in women, um, in 2007, I got a group of 
adult GI female gastroenterologists in the area, and we began to have meetings periodically just over dinner, and it kind of grew to this, uh, what we call women in GI, and it's adult and pediatric GI, some surgeons, GI fellows, and GI nurses and support staff, and we meet, we have dinner, there's usually a lecture, and there's an opportunity uh, to network. I've also given several lectures for OBGYN Grand Rounds, talking about colon cancer screening and functional bowel disorders. We have something in our um, healthcare system called Girls Night Out, where we have a uh, an event once a year, and it gets all the female uh, medical staff together. And again, it just gives me an opportunity to, in a very casual way, talk to people about my interest in in women's health, women's digestive issues. And then finally, I also given presentations at various uh, women's organizations at churches. Uh, alumni, uh, sorority organizations, junior league, um, again, educating about the need for colon cancer screening um, and other digestive issues that affect women. Next slide. So when you're getting to the point where you're deciding to set up a center, um, first you've identified that there is a need. Uh, the next thing is to try to decide what type of center. Um, is it going to be a virtual center or a, a physical structure? I can tell you that in, in being in private practice, it's going to be very difficult to get all of those pieces together in one, uh, under one roof. Um, but a virtual center is quite doable. And I'm on a campus where all of the pieces are within walking distance, so it's very easy for me to get uh, patients to the appropriate referral um, uh, providers and ancillary uh, services. Um, I think it's important to identify like-minded physicians. There are some digestive centers for women that are very spa-like, and that really wasn't my intention. I think if you want to have a spa day, go, you know, go and have a great spa day. But um, if you want uh, a place or a group of providers that you can go to to address your, your different health needs, then that's what, what we're offering. Having ancillary service providers in place, again, I think the nutrition is huge, um, and then having complementary services available um, to patients, including massage therapy. Um, I, I also have an um, acupuncturist that I, I refer to, and also an exercise therapist. Next slide. Uh, mental health issues, I wanted to just uh, briefly talk about this. So at early on, um, I tried to have a clinical psychologist come in a couple of times per month to meet with our patients. And again, I, I, I think it's important to address those issues. However, the problem that we would get into is um, uh, benefits. Not all plans have um, benefits that they could see a clinical psychologist and all. And although we had a discounted rate, it still proved to be um, out of the price range for uh, several of our patients. I work with a great clinical psychologist who has an interest in functional bowel disorders. And I, I do send patients to her, but we no longer have her coming into the office. Something that has been helpful is actually having patients do life coaching. And uh, we can talk more about that later if anyone is interested. But you can get um, a group together and a six to eight week course uh, with a life coach has made a huge difference in a number of my patients with um, irritable bowel syndrome and uh, patients who are trying to lose weight. Next slide. So um, my practice is a, a single specialty GI group in North Texas, and we have about 50 physicians. Uh, I'm in a group of five, uh, the only woman in the group. In uh, 2012, um, my patient population, about 80% of my patients are female with the average age of 53. Um, over the last 18 months, I've had a 12% increase in unique patient visits, and most of, this, uh, most of these visits are women. Um, I have a few men that I've conspired with their wives to get them in here for uh, screening colonoscopies, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's women patients. Um, I've had an 8% increase in procedures, and most of these procedures are being done at the uh, uh, 
uh, Ambulatory Surgical Center. Next slide. Um, the hospital that I'm currently at is a healthcare delivery system in North Texas that covers about 16 counties. There are 25 acute and short stay hospitals. Um, our hospital is kind of the referral hospital, so we see uh, more complicated cases coming in from North Texas. What's, what's helpful at my hospital is that we have a dedicated women's and infants hospital. And in that hospital, not only do they uh, do deliveries, um, we have the uh, OBGYNs housed in that area too. So it's, it's, um, it's a nice relationship that I can just walk over to the Perot, this Women in Health um, building if I need to. Um, in our hospital, we have 18 gastroenterologists on staff, and uh, there are only two women, so there's ample opportunity um, for the women um, here to be involved in, in caring for our female patients. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just kind of a map I just wanted to put in to show how the way that my office, the location of my office and the hospital setup really allows me to um, be able to send my patients to the appropriate um, referring doctor, nutrition, counseling, um, um, OBGYN, because it's not, a, it's not a huge campus and most things are in walking distance. Uh, next slide. So I think when considering a women's digestive health service line, um, the first thing is identifying a need. And I, and I definitely think that there is a need. From everything that I've heard back from my patients, the willingness for some of these uh, women to wait weeks um, for my next available, it just behooves me. But they are willing and ready to do that. Um, set, setting a vision um, and intention on what you want the, the service line to look like I think is extremely important and again getting like-minded individuals to work with you. Um, I think in private practice a, a virtual center definitely works and um, uh, if you decide to bring in other components like a nutritionist or a mental health provider um, whether or not those folks come in as, you know, contract employees, those are things that you kind of have to uh, figure out. Um, what's been helpful for me, too, is that I, I think overall um, the patient experience is better. Um, because I'm seeing more patients now with pelvic floor problems and motility problems, you know, I'm learning anal rectal manometry. I was trained to do esophageal manometry, but now I realize how important it is for, uh, for me to actually do my anal rectal manometry, um, hemorrhoid banding, um, injectable therapies for treatment of uh, fecal incontinence. So, you know, I continue to grow uh, from a skill standpoint in my practice. Uh, next slide. So with that, I think I will um, end my presentation. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer that and share my experience, um, any comments. And I'm curious to know what everyone else is kind of doing out there. So with that, I Thank will you. stop. OK. Thank you very much, Kim. No, that's, that was a jam-packed jam half hour of information. No. Um, you know, in our practice as well up in Chicago is growing with respect to our, our female gastroenterologists and they're busy almost as soon as they get added to the practice. It's amazing. Um, um, you know, one of the things I think for me, um, I wanted to kind of get in on the front end because what I would see is that I would see women coming in who had, uh, who had a number of procedures done before getting to me and, you know, wanted me to kind of fix the problem, and it would be nice to kind of, I'm like, okay, I'm here to help patients, but to get, on the, get in on the front end of that was one of the uh, reasons that I decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and try to get myself out there as someone who has this interest, um, so I wouldn't be coming in on the back end of things just trying to fix the problem, but actually be involved 
and okay, if they need a colonoscopy, let's get them in and get them uh, get their colonoscopy done. So it was somewhat out of necessity that this was um, developed in our group. Yeah, the the other issue that I think you brought up that's very very pertinent is the the women are usually the point of entry for the family into healthcare. Yeah. And you mentioned you mentioned that some of your female patients actually were the conduit for getting their husbands in to get their procedures done. And really? um, you know, it's it's another another additional way of getting patients into our practices. Yeah. Interesting. Our 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 patients who come in for screening colonoscopy, the average age for women is 53, the average age for men is between 58 and 59. So the men are losing at an entire cycle yep. of screening colonoscopies if they have polyps. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, we have a few minutes to take some questions. And as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it in the question pane, and it will be answered in turn. If we can't get to all the questions, we'll post uh, a Q&A online. So I think I'm going to turn this over to staff to help us uh, field the questions. So I hope, Laura and Amy, you're, you're there for us. Thanks so much, Kim and Larry, for that excellent presentation. We've had a number of questions come in, um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, the first question is directed to Kim. Um, if you could pick one group, uh, gynecology, nutrition, et cetera, to collaborate with to create a successful women's GI program, which one would you recommend focusing on? Probably nutrition. Um, and that may be the easiest piece to add. When I was looking at this initially, I mean, um, you can get a nutritionist, um, probably starting salary is going to be about 50, 50,000 for some, someone recently out of training. Um, I know for us, much of the discussion that I will have with my patients after we've discussed their inflammatory bowel disease and their different diseases, okay, so now what should I eat? And so there's so many dietary questions. And so I end up referring a lot uh, to um, dietitians and nutritionists. Um, and that may be easier to add that piece versus getting a gynecologist who has his or her own very busy practice um, into your clinic. So that would be my next step. Thanks. Um, how are you advertising the program? So much of it um, is through our hospital. There is this, um, as I said, the women's hospital. They have a women's health focus. And if you go to the hospital website, they have an area that shows uh, diseases across a woman's lifetime. And so there's a section where they will have, okay, between the ages of 50 and 60 things that you're supposed to have done, and they'll have, okay, screening this, screening colonoscopies, and then that links them to our GI lab if they call to um, schedule their screening, and then that gets directed and funneled towards me. So um, that way, a lot of it is just the uh, going out and, and, and giving the, the talks to the different um, organizations on our a website, our practice website, part of my interest in my bio includes uh, women's health. Thank you. Another question, um, what is the reimbursement model for a nutritionist and a psychologist? Yeah, so with the psychologist, that's why it was a little bit difficult. Um, and I, I'd be curious to know what, it, you know, if anyone else has had experience with this. So what we try to do is to have a clinical psychologist come in a couple of times a month, and she would just kind of lease space in the office. And if we saw someone who had um, significant uh, issues, anxiety, depression, you know, they're holding a box of Kleenex, so as soon as you walk into the room, you kind of get an idea that they may need um, some additional counseling, we would have them schedule with a clinical psychologist and come back later that month for the visit. We could not keep her busy 
because many of the patients, uh, they just couldn't afford uh, paying for it if they didn't have um, benefits with their um, insurance, and so that didn't necessarily work. Um, and again, with the nutrition component of it, um, ideally what I would like to see is in our large group that we have a nutritionist hired uh, by our group, but then on a, let's say Monday, which is when I see most of my um, women, have her in the clinic on when, on that day so that they can see the patients after I've um, evaluated them and have a discussion regarding diet and nutrition at that, at that point. Great, thank you. Um, I've had a couple of questions come in regarding the lack of reimbursement to, to dietitians for these types of uh, you know, GI disorders. Can you speak yeah. um, to how you deal with reimbursement issues with your dietitians? Yeah, no, so that is an issue. Um, you know, so a lot, a lot of it is, I mean, there are patients who have the means to pay for, you know, a, a 30 minute, a 60 minute consultation with a dietitian because you're absolutely right. I mean, there are, you know, IBS is, is usually not one of the diagnoses that would be covered. So a lot of, a lot of that would be uh, an out of pocket out-of-pocket expense for the patient. Thank you. Um, how are you using your program and your fellowship training, if at all? I'm sorry, say that again now? How are you using your program and your fellowship training, if at all? Using this program and fellowship training? Yes. Um, yeah, I don't think we're actually, so we have fellows who rotate with us, um, but there's not, um, we don't have like a dedicated fellow who's, who's, who's involved in, in it. I don't know if that was the question or if it, or was it in my training as during fellowship? Did that help me with this? Um, I'm going to ask the person who submitted that question to just re-submit um, a more clarified question. Um, but I'm thinking that your response answered her question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have a point person, um, for example, a nurse navigator, to help facilitate access and all the different forms of care that you provide to these patients? So I think because I have these established referral patterns, um, when I have a patient who is leaving and, you know, on my discharge, on the clinical summary, you know, referrals to gynecology, um, nu uh, nutrition referral, there, it's fairly standard. And because I've worked, I think, with these providers, it's, it's you know, within 48 hours, I can get someone in to see the GYN that I typically refer to um, or to see the nutritionist. Um, so it's at the point where they're discharged that uh, my assistant uh, makes those um, connections. Great, thank you. I've had a couple of questions asking you to expand more on life coaching in your practice. So this is actually, um, anyone who's done life coaching I think will attest that First, it may seem seem a little hokey, but um, I think I think it actually makes a huge difference. So um, you can find a life coach is someone who undergoes certain uh, uh, a certification process, and there are different life coaching entities out there. And there's one that I've worked with, and I think that they're great. And what they do is that um, a patient can uh, make contact with a life coach, and usually it's um, weekly sessions for six to eight weeks, and they can address different areas of their lives, and if it's weight loss that they want to do, if it's um, IBS, uh, irritable bowel, functional things, they can work with a life coach, and they don't work specifically on any particular area, but there's this global um, uh, work that the patient does with the, the health coach, the life coach. They can do it as a group. I had a, a group of patients who did like four or five of them actually decided to uh, get a group together. And it was actually quite affordable. And at the end of a six-week period, 
um, their IBS symptoms were better. Um, those who had wanted to lose weight, they were able to lose weight. Um, and it's just, it's an affordable option, I think, for those patients who may not have uh, mental health, uh, uh, be able to afford uh, mental health counseling from a psychologist or go to psychiatry. Um, and I'd be more than happy offline to tell anyone um, who I use, I prefer to. Thank you. What kind of increase in your market share have you seen, if any, in developing a women's GI service line? Um, I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are, are still um, a number of patients out there uh, that I would like to get them into my, into my practice, and, you know, there's some referral patterns that are just very well established with the colorectal surgeons and gynecologists that um, I may not be able to um, break into that, but um, I just I just can uh, just report what my what my patient encounters have done over the last um, 18 months, but I'm not sure exactly what percentage of the market I have. Thanks. Um, last two questions that I have for you. Um, the first is, how did you find a biofeedback program in your area, especially in a non-academic area? Um, actually, that occurred with one of the uh, networking um, events, the Women in GI, uh, talking with many female gastroenterologists have, we all have the same struggle, so we're seeing a lot of these women with pelvic floor problems, and I and it started there. And someone mentioned, "Oh, you know, there's a wonderful person who does biofeedback," and uh, got her contact information, met with her, and then you know just started that that line of referrals. But they're out there um, in private practice, um, and there's. Uh, the the urogynecologist may know really good talented people who are doing it, um, but it wasn't that hard to find someone. Thanks. Um, last question: um, Do you have any grants to offset the costs of developing the service line? Yeah, um, I do not, and I and I don't know, Larry, if you know of anything that's um, available out there, um, but that would be that would be a huge help um, to have that available. I myself don't know either, Kim, but it, it certainly would be. It, it would seem very much to me like something that would be um, in somebody's crosshairs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today on the AGA-sponsored webinar on building a non-procedural women's GI service line. The recording of the session will be available on the AGA website in a few weeks. Additionally, the entire online publication for all three non-procedural service lines, uh, you know, including the previous webinars, are available on our website at gastro.org uh, forward slash uh, practice forward slash non-procedural business lines. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you to everybody for your attention, and uh, have a good day.